Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. Let me begin by telling you today about a man named David that is in heaven. But Teresa and I met him back when we were young. In fact, we've been married a couple of years. I was in seminary full-time, and I was pastoring full-time. I'd just gone actually to my second church, which was quite a step up in terms of responsibility. So frankly, I had my hands full. And meanwhile, we had just had our first child, James Jr. He was just a month old. And so I had gone to this church and, and preached in this church in, in view of a call, and they had elected us. They'd called us to the church on a Sunday morning. That afternoon, we had kind of a meet and greet with anybody that wanted to come and meet the new pastor. Now, we didn't know anybody at the church. And we made a commitment when we first got married, no matter what sacrifice we had to make, that Teresa would be a stay-at-home mom. So I'm in seminary. I'm pastoring full-time. I'm, you know, loaded up. She's got a, you know, a little month-old baby. And we needed help, but we didn't know where to find it. So we're in the church on Sunday afternoon, and people were sitting there. I don't know there was I don't know how many people, probably 100, 125 people, and they'd ask questions and so forth. And then we had prayer, and then people wanted to come up and meet me. Well, I noticed out of the corner of my eye, coming down the aisle, there was this heavy set, barrel chested man, and I mean, the moment I looked eyes, the moment I looked at him, I'm telling you, sirens and alarms just went off in my head. I said, "Okay, this guy is trouble." He had a Marine crew cut and a big gap right in the middle. His teeth were probably that far apart. He had a big gap in his teeth. Belly was literally hanging over his belt buckle, not, not making any of this up. His shirt was unbuttoned at the bottom. I could literally see his belly button sticking out. He was uh, wearing some old wrinkled trousers that barely came to the top of his ankles. And to top it all off, he was wearing white socks. Now, that's a big deal because my dad always told me growing up, son, beware of men that wear white socks because always, it always meant, number one, they were cheap, and number two, they were against everything. So here comes this guy down the aisle, and I'm thinking, okay, I said something he didn't like. This is going to not go well. And I braced myself, and I was expecting the worst, and he came up to me, and here's all he said. He said, Pastor, my name is David Roark. I have a wife and four daughters. He said, we don't have a lot of money. He said, but Carol and I and our daughters would love to help you watch and take care of your little baby boy anytime you want us to. Well, I'll be honest. I blew him off. I remember we got in the car to go back to the seminary. We were going to move down to the field the next week. We got back. We were driving to the seminary. And I got in the car and I told Teresa, I said, well, I said, I met my number one troublemaker. She said, who? I said, that, that David guy. She said, David, I said, you know, the crew cut guy with the gap? She said, yeah, guy, guy was kind of dressed funny. I said, yeah. I said, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to keep my eye on him. Well, I did. David and Carol became another set of parents for us. They became a third set of grandparents to my baby boy and later to Jonathan. They became just like family, and they're still that way today. I almost missed out on one of the greatest friendships I've ever had. I almost missed out on one of the sweetest, most precious, most treasured relationships I've ever known. You know why? Because I violated perhaps our culture's favorite Bible verse. You know what it is? You know what? You know the Bible verse that most Americans love more than any Bible verse at all? It's this one. Judge not 
that you be not judged. Judge not that you be not judged. Now, it's not surprising that Christians like me have at least one favorite Bible verse. But what is surprising is there are a lot of non-Christians that have a favorite Bible verse. And for the majority of Christians in America, it is this verse. Because this card is played everywhere, somewhere, every day in our country. You hear it all the time. Who are you to judge me? You can't judge me. You can't say what I'm doing is wrong. Who are you to point your finger? Who are you to even try to bring judgment to me? I mean, even people that don't believe the Bible, even the people that don't even like the Bible, they love to quote this verse with relish. Judge not that you be not judged. And I'll be honest, there's a tendency to go to one of two extremes. Look, I know, I get it. There are some people, the moment they get out of their bed, they exchange their pajamas for ju ju judicial robes. I mean, they, they, they get up and they're the kind of people, they're going to judge anything and everybody that moves for just about any reason. There are people like that. I pastor them. I know they're there. But I don't think that's our biggest problem today. The other extreme, which I think is more prevalent, is more and more people now won't judge anything or anybody for any reason. They, they, they just want to go along to get along. They get up every day and their attitude is, I hear no evil. I see no evil. I speak no evil. I don't want to be accused of being judgmental at all. Now, the reason why I want to deal with that today is because we're in a series we've been calling From There to Here. And we've identified five number one reasons, five big reasons why people who are not believers look at Christianity and say, you know what? I just can't get there from here. I can't make that trek. I can't cross that bridge. We've given five reasons. Today, we deal with the last one. And you can guess what it is. It's judgmentalism. It's one of the five biggest barriers that keep people from coming to church. And it keeps people from coming to Christianity. Because people today equate the church today with this holier-than-thou attitude that screams what they are against and whispers what they're for. And unfortunately, too many people hear our criticism, but they don't see our compassion. They hear the condemnation, but they don't feel the care. And I want to humbly admit, for a good part of this, we're pretty much guilty as charged. We are, and we just need to admit it. But we're going to look today at what I believe, in my opinion, is maybe the most misunderstood, misused, misapplied verse in the entire Bible. By the way, it's not just unbelievers who misapply this verse. It's also believers who make the same mistake. David Gelertner, you probably never heard of him. He is a professor at Yale University. He actually survived an attack by the Unabomber. He's one of the few guys that lived. He explains something. I didn't know this. The word judgmental is of surprisingly recent usage. Listen to this. If you go back and find a dictionary in 1970, you won't even find the word judgmental there. We didn't even use the word back then. But it was only recently that the noun judgment would begin to be used in a negative way. Up until that time, it was a good thing to be a judge. It was a good thing to judge things that were right, judge things that were wrong. It was used in a very positive, honorable way. But today, judgmental is something that's harsh. It's something that's negative. It's something that's pejorative. So what we're going to do today is we're going to dive into exactly what Jesus meant and exactly what Jesus didn't mean. We're going to look at exactly what Jesus said and exactly what he did not say. But let me just say this. I want to humbly say this, and I really mean this. If you're one of those people who either have left the church or you won't go to church because of judgmental Christians, because we scream what we're against, we whisper what we are for, and you've been hurt because of Christians overbearing judgmentalism. I just want to say two things. Number one, I, I apologize. I, I ask on their behalf your forgiveness. We, we don't want to be that way. I can tell you as pastor of this church, we do not want to be known as a church where people find judgment. We want to be a church where people find grace. So if you're one of those people and you've, you've, you've been hurt, your family's been hurt, your parents were hurt, whatever, and that's why you've kind of cut us out of the picture would you just give us one more chance? You've come to the right place today. You're going to hear the right word. So let's just look clearly at what Jesus meant by what Jesus said. He actually said three things. Number one, he said we are to judge 
honestly. By the way, I'm in Matthew chapter 7. If you want to get your Bibles out, I'm in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Okay, let's look at what he said. The word for judge literally means to discriminate or to make a difference. Now, here's what you need to understand. That word is not always used in a negative fashion. Nowhere in the Bible is it always used that way as it is here. Here's what it means here. When Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, what he meant was to offer a criticism that's either unfair or unjustified. When you do that, you're being judgmental. When you, when you, when you condemn something, you criticize something, but it's not just, it's not justified, it's not fair, that is being judgmental. And keep in mind, Jesus is doing this in the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to disciples. He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. And here's what he was saying. He was teaching that true discipleship was and is saying in effect, here's what he was saying. You want to be a disciple of mine? Then you need to understand this. If you're going to follow me, you should be the least judgmental of anybody. And yet he said, you may battle being more judgmental than anybody. That's why he didn't say this to the unbelievers. He said it to the believers. He didn't say it to people that didn't attend church. He said it to people who did attend church. He said, look, you, if you're going to follow me, you should be the least judgmental, but you've got to be on your guard. You may tend to be the most judgmental. And let's be honest. For people who attend church and attend church for a long time, who try to live the Christian life, who believe it is important to obey God's commandments, can we, let's just be honest. It is easy to fall into this holier-than-thou attitude. It's, it's really easy to look down our noses at people who don't live up to our standards, who don't reach our standards, because it's so easy for us to elevate our preferences over God's principles. It's so easy for us to judge people on what we think they ought to be and what we think they ought to do. Now, before we go any further, you need to understand this. We've got to differentiate between condemning a sinner and condemning a sin. Because as you're going to see in a moment, judgment is right if it's done the right way, in the right time, with the right people, with the right spirit. Otherwise, it's wrong. You say, well, I got a question. How do you know when you've crossed the line? How do you know when you're doing the right thing? How do you know when you're doing it the wrong way? How do you know? All right, here's the principle. When your standard of calling anything wrong is based on anything other than the clear teaching of a moral command in the Word of God, you're being judgmental. And we'll say that again. When your standard of calling anything wrong is based on anything other than the clear teaching of a moral command in the Word of God, you are being judgmental. When I was a boy growing up, there were people who said, it is wrong to go to movies. There were people who said, it is wrong to play cards. There were people who said, it is wrong to dance. They were being judgmental. It was their preference. It was their opinion. But it was not based on any clear teaching in the Word of God. And when you judge someone's motives rather than their methods, you're being judgmental. When you judge why people do something rather than what people do, you're being judgmental. When you judge other people based on your opinions, your feelings, your self-based standards, and you do it in a condemning way that's either unfair or unjustified, you're being judgmental. Having said that, listen carefully. It is not wrong. It is never wrong to judge an action or to judge conduct when God's Word plainly says it's wrong. So let me just make you, if you don't hear anything else, hear this next statement. It is never wrong to call wrong wrong when God calls it wrong. That's not being judgmental. It is never wrong to call wrong wrong when God calls it wrong. I'll give you some very simple examples. I am not judging anyone when I say adultery is wrong. Not too long ago, I confronted a man who's attended this church who moved in with a female. I confronted him. I said, what you're doing is wrong. The Bible calls it fornication. As a matter of fact, all sex outside of marriage between a man and a woman is wrong. That's not being judgmental. Lying is wrong. Stealing is wrong. Pride is wrong. Hatred is wrong. Envy is wrong. Racism is wrong. That's not my judgment. That's what God's Word plainly teaches. See, those are the things I don't have to judge. You know why? God's already judged them. I'm just saying what God has said. By the way, let me just say this. 
you can even use the right standard and still be judgmental if you judge someone with the wrong spirit or you condemn them without having all the information. Here's a great example. I read the other day about a girlfriend that wanted to call her boyfriend. His name was Mike. But when she dialed the number, she hit the wrong digit. Well, it so happens she got the number of a man who had the same name as her boyfriend. So the woman, this woman answers the phone, and this girl says, uh, is Mike there? And the woman said, well, he's in the shower. And the girlfriend said, well, would you please tell him his girlfriend called and hung up? Well, after an hour, he hadn't called back. Well, she just hit redial and called the same number. This time, a man answered. He said, uh, this is Mike. Well, immediately, she recognized that was not her boyfriend's voice, and she said, you're not my boyfriend. He said, I know. It's what I've been trying to tell my wife for the last hour. See, you, you can't judge until you have all the facts. You may think you're doing the right thing, but if you do it in the wrong way for the wrong reason, you're being judgmental. And the reason why we have to be so careful and make sure that we're judging things honestly is because of the original principle that Jesus laid out. Keep, listen to what he said. This is so sobering for me. Jesus said, in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Here's what Jesus said. Just as there are certain physical laws that govern the universe, there are certain spiritual laws that do the same thing. For example, Isaac Newton's third law of motion may be the most famous one of all. You, you've heard what it is, right? For every action, there is an opposite and equal what? Right, reaction. For every action, there is an opposite and equal reaction. Jesus gave what I call the law of measures. Jesus said, the way you judge others is the way you will be judged. How you judge other people is exactly how other people will judge you. So when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, the first thing he was really saying was, judge honestly. Here's the second thing Jesus said. We are to judge humbly. We're to judge honestly, right way, right place, right standard, right reason. But he says we are to judge humbly. Now we're going to get into the meat of what Jesus was really saying because he explains what he meant now in verse 1, and he asked two questions. He asked a why question and a how question. Matthew 7, verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? Now, Jesus had a great sense of humor. I can assure you, if you'd been back in that day, there would have been laughter going on because Jesus paints this picture that's just hilarious. He said, here's a man focusing like a laser beam on a speck of sawdust in one man's eye while he's got a two by four sticking out of his own. As a matter of fact, the word for speck literally means splinter. Now, do you know what a speck is, right? You know what a speck is? You know what a splinter is? A splinter is just a piece of a plank. That's all it is. So here's a man that's got a splinter in his eye, but you've got a plank in yours. A splinter is just a piece of a plank. What was Jesus saying? He's saying something that we all know is true. This is a great psycho psychological truth. I'm not even a psychologist. Do you know what we tend to criticize in other people so much, so much of the time? We criticize faults in other people that we have in our own lives. We just project it onto them. Let me give you a great example. Have you ever noticed that people who gossip, gossip about people who gossip? You ever notice that? People who gossip, gossip about people who gossip. Finding someone else's fault is just to chip off your block. See, there's just, and by the way, this is just a basic principle of human nature. Look, I do the same thing. We tend to look, we tend to see a splinter in someone else's eye as a log. We tend to see a log in our eye as just a splinter. I'm going to confess. I tend to look at other people's faults with a microscope, and I look at my own faults with a telescope. I tend to really take notice of somebody else's faults. But I give myself a lot of grace to my faults. You know why? Because we all have blind spots. Did you know that? By the way, I didn't know this until this, till I studied this message. Did you know that everyone literally has a blind spot? I didn't know this. If you're an ophthalmologist, you know this. 
The place where the optic nerve passes through the optic disc in your eye is a literal blind spot that we all have. Everybody has it. It's about 7.5 degrees high and about five degrees wide. You say, well, why don't we notice them? Because our brains have been wired to kind of just blank them out. It's it's, it's the reason why no matter how great a person you are, you think you are, we're all guilty. And I'm one of them. We are all guilty of misjudging, misinforming, misunderstanding. Now, I want to be honest. I pastored five churches. I have never pastored a church yet. I pastored five of them that I didn't have what I call spec inspectors. Every church I've ever pastored has had spec inspectors. Every church I've ever pastored has what I've called splinter specialist. I mean, they are experts at finding fault. Their spiritual gift is offering criticism. They love to pass judgment. And we all have to battle the same problem. See, we've got 20-20 vision when it comes to his fault. We've got 20-20 vision when it comes to her fault. We've got 20-20 vision when it comes to their faults. But when it comes to our faults, we're blind as a bat. And the point that Jesus is making is very simple. He says, look, before you're so quick to judge other people, why don't you start with yourself? I got convicted just working on this message, and this thought came to me. You know, James, maybe if you started judging other people more, maybe you'd judge other people less. So here's a thought. If you want to see what you look like, what do you do? You look in a mirror. If you want to see what other people look like, what do you do? You look out a window. What Jesus is saying is, before you look out the window, look in the mirror. That's what he's saying. He's not saying don't look out the window. That's not what he said. He said, before you look out the window, look in the mirror. So the next time you spot a splinter in someone else's life, make sure you don't have a log in your own. So the point is, it's not that we're not to judge wrongdoing. We are. It's not that we're to call out whatever is wrong if God calls it wrong. But he says, we are to do it with all humility. So here's a good rule to follow. Confession of our faults must always come before criticism of others' faults. Before you criticize anybody, judge man, Lord, am I guilty of this? Is there something in me I need to correct? There was a little girl that was watching her mother do dishes one, one uh, evening, and she suddenly noticed the way the light shined on her mother's hair, that there was some white hair mixed in with her mother's red hair. She said, Mother, she said, why are some of your hairs turning white? Well, the mother thought, this is a great teachable moment. She said, well, honey, that's because every time you do something wrong, And every time you make mother cry, every time you break mother's heart, one of her hairs turns white. She was feeling so smug and so good in what she had said. And then the little girl said, well, mama, how come all of grandma's hairs are so white? Now, here's the point. We're to judge honestly, but we're also to judge humbly. Before you go looking for the speck, Look for the plank. Before you look out the window, look in the mirror. Then Jesus kind of draws it all up with a bow with the third point that a lot of people don't want to miss or don't want to know or they purposely miss. Jesus said, we are to judge helpfully. Honestly, humbly, but helpfully. Now we're going to see why it's so important to take a text and put it in context. There's an old saying I learned in seminary that any text without a context is just a pretext. And that's true. And there's no more, there's no more verse subjected to this than this, this verse in Matthew chapter 7. Judge not that you be not judged. And if you just leave it there, you say, well, I guess I can't say anything about anybody if they're doing wrong. I just got to keep my mouth shut. No, you got to put it in context. And this is a great example. See, if Jesus had just stopped at verse 1 and gone on to another topic, I'd been done 30 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. And that kind of settles the matter, right? It would be an absolute statement. Don't judge or you'll be judged. Okay, I won't. But then you go down to verse five and you say, oh, now I understand what you meant. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, you hypocrite. What's a hypocrite? A hypocrite is someone that spots the speck but doesn't look at the plank. That's a hypocrite. 
He said, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, put a circle around that word hypocrite. That's who he's talking about, hypocrite. You remember we talked about this earlier. Hypocrisy is one of the five barriers to belief. Here's what a hypocrite is. You ready for here? Here's what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is someone who always looks out the window but never looks in the mirror. That's a hypocrite. A hypocrite is someone who always focuses on the splinter, not the plank. That's a hypocrite. So notice what Jesus said. He did not say, don't you ever look out the window and judge anything that's wrong. You be quiet. Hear no evil, see no evil. No, 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 he didn't say that. What he said was, first look in the mirror and see where you may be wrong. And the reason why most people misunderstand what Jesus said is because, to be honest, they try to make Jesus say something he never said, and they try to make Jesus mean something that he never meant. Because there are two key words in this verse, the word first and the word then. See, everybody wants to remember the first clause. First, take the plank out of your own eye. But they want to forget the then clause. Then you take the speck out of the other's eye. So what Jesus was saying was real simple. Yes, there is a right time. And there is a right way. And there is a right place. And there are right people who can exercise right judgment. However, Jesus said, judgment should begin at home. It should start with you. It doesn't begin with the other person you see out the window. It begins with the you that you see in the mirror. So here's the point. Contrary to what our culture believes, Jesus is not forbidding judgment that's done at the right time, at the right place, and the right way with the right spirit. As a matter of fact, listen to this. Did you know that one of the marks that you are a spiritually mature Christian? Did you know that one of the marks you are a really fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ is that you judge others accurately? Don't take my word for it. A man by the name of Paul, the apostle Paul, wrote these words. He said, the spiritual person, you consider yourself spiritually? So yeah, I try to be. Then you judge all things. That's not a contradiction. That's a clarification. You judge all things. It is not wrong to confront a person if there's sin in that person's life. As a matter of fact, let me just go further. Not only is it not wrong to confront a person with sin if there's sin in their life, it's wrong if you don't. It's wrong if you say nothing. Parents need to be doing that with their kids from the time that they're young. When you see someone walking down a deadly, dark, destructive path, you owe it to them to judge what they're doing and to tell them they're going the wrong way. Now, you do it honestly, you do it humbly, but you do it helpfully. You do it because you want what's best for them. So what Jesus is actually doing is he is commanding us to take the speck out of our brother's eye. That involves making a judgment. All Jesus is saying is, but before you do that, you get your own house in order. Before you go for the speck, you go for the plank. Before you look out the window, you look in the mirror. And he says, when you do that, then you will judge helpfully and not hypocritically. So let me just make this real plain. I can, you say, so what are you telling me? I'm gonna, here's my sermon in a sentence. Jesus is not telling us in this passage not to judge. He's telling us how to judge. He's not telling us not to judge. He's telling us how to judge. Listen, people that say, Judge not that you be not judged. Let me just tell you how ignorant that is. You couldn't even live your life on a daily basis if you didn't make judgments every single day. We make tons of judgments every day between good and evil, right and wrong, danger and safety, when to say something and when to say nothing. We do it all the time. Of course we're to judge. Everybody judges, but we need to do it helpfully, humbly, and honestly, now, let me just stop right here and say this. We do series of messages here all the time, and I realize, I get it, and I, I'm not griping when I say this, but we kind of tend to leave series on the floor, right? We go through a series on whatever we might, maybe it's on marriage, it's on family, it's on this, it's on that. And we go, boy, that's a, that was a good series, but, you know, what's next? I do not want you to do that with this series. I don't want you to leave this series behind. Let me tell you why. Our number one job as a church is what Jesus called the Great Commission. 
We're to make disciples and baptize them and teach them to follow Jesus. We're to go after people who don't know Jesus and do everything we can to lead them to Jesus and inspire them to live the cross-shaped life. That's our role. That's our job. What kind of society would we have if nobody judged anything for any reason? If we didn't have judges who passed sentences, who incarcerated criminals, we'd have anarchy. What would happen to the rule of law if everybody who sat on a jury decided when it came to a rapist or a child molester or a murderer or a terrorist, what if they said, well, who am I to judge? Who am I to condemn you? I mean, I, after all, judge not that you be not judged. No, it's just the opposite. Because of judgment, listen, because of judgment that's right and good, we've got child labor laws. We've got civil rights. Because of good judgment, we've got the Bill of Rights. And the truth of the matter is, we cannot shirk our responsibility when it comes to judgment. Yes, we must always be looking for the plank in our own eye. Yes, we must always look in the mirror first. But once we confess it, own up to it, deal with it, and remove it, once we've done that, then we need to help other people pull the splinter out of their own eye. So Jesus said it perfectly when he said this. Stop judging by mere appearances. That's hypocrisy. But instead, judge correctly. So we wrap it up. No, you never judge a tree by its leaves. But you do judge a tree by its fruit. You don't judge a book by its cover like I did with David Rohrhark. But you do judge a book by its content. No, you don't judge a person by the color of their skin but you do judge a person by the content of their character. And here's what I want to close with. All of this makes the cross of Jesus shine and sparkle like a diamond in the noonday sun because you know what Jesus did on the cross? Listen to this. Jesus didn't even have a speck in his eye, not even a speck. But you know what he did? He took the plank. He took the log. He took the two by four that's been in every eye that has ever been formed and he put it into his and he accepted the judgment that should have been ours so that we should never have to be judged. He is the supreme judge of the universe. His judgment of all judgments is the most humble, the most honest, the most helpful, and the most holy of all. And if you will allow him to judge your sins before you die, he will never judge your sins after you die. So let's all follow in his footsteps. Would you pray with me right now? With his bowed, with eyes closed. I want to say a word to those of you who, for whatever the reason, any or all of the reasons we've been given in this series, you quit church, you gave up on church, you, did, you know, you've given up on Christianity, it's not for you. May I tell you this, listen, I would never ask you to put your faith in any church. I would never ask you to put your faith in any preacher or any pastor. I would never ask you to put your faith in any individual Christian, no matter how good that Christian is. Let me tell you why. You give our church enough rope, we'll hang ourselves. You give our church enough of an opportunity, we will fail you. You give me enough of an opportunity, I will fail you. You give any Christian enough opportunity, he or she will fail you. But the reason why I'm asking you to put your faith in Jesus is because he will never fail you. Yes, there are judgmental Christians. Yes, they are. But don't let their judgment keep you from Jesus. Yes, there are hypocritical Christians. But don't let their hypocrisy keep you from Jesus. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to make it plain. He died for your sins. He came back from the grave. He has paid your sin debt that you owed. He'll give you the free gift of eternal life if you'll just trust Him as your Savior and trust Him as your Lord. <clears throat> so don't let the devil fool you into thinking you've got a good excuse why you've rejected Jesus. Because there's no excuse for rejecting Jesus. Yeah, maybe you had a good excuse for a while to reject the church. I'm sorry. 
Maybe you have a good excuse sometime not to really put your trust in preachers. I'm sorry. Maybe you've got a good excuse. You've, you've lived next door to Christians that didn't really live like Christians. I'm sorry. But don't let that keep you from Jesus. And if right now you would say, I want Jesus. I want to trust Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to know I'm forgiven of my sins. I want to know I have eternal life. Then just say this to Jesus right now. Right now, just say this to Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner just like everybody else. I need a Savior. I believe you are that Savior. I believe you died for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead, and I believe you're alive right now. So, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sins. I repent and turn away from my sinful ways. And I ask you to come into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. Okay, hey, put your eyes back on me for a minute. You prayed that prayer? Yes, I did. Did you mean it? Yes, I did. Well, here's the good news. When you mean business with Jesus, he means business with you. The 2023 Mountaintop Conference is headed back to the beautiful Mansion Theater in Branson, Missouri, October 2nd through 4th. Don't miss this exciting event packed with impactful preaching from Dr. James Merritt and the powerful vocals of Charles Billingsley, the Booth Brothers, and Jim and Melissa Brady. In addition to Dr. Merritt, two of his friends join him, Pastor Ted Cunningham from Woodland Hills Family Church in Branson, and decorated Black Hawk Down Army veteran Dr. Jeff Struker will bring inspiring messages. You will leave relaxed, refreshed, and renewed after spending time in the beautiful Ozark Mountains with old and new friends. Visit mountaintopconference.com for all the details and make plans to join Dr. James Merritt at the 2023 Mountaintop Conference. As a pastor for 45 years, I have studied and read through the Bible many, many times. One thing I've noticed is how many of the people in the Bible battle their emotions. You can read stories of women and men struggling with grief, anger, guilt, and despair, but you also see a loving God who provides divine wisdom for transforming emotional trials into spiritual triumphs. In my new book, How to Deal with How You Feel, I present biblically-based steps to help you understand and deal with the emotions that may be weighing you down. And throughout the book, you'll find a roadmap to improve your emotional health and your spiritual health because I truly believe the God who created your emotions has also given you everything you need to navigate them. You can order your copy of How to Deal with How You Feel right now through your favorite bookseller or by using the link on the screen. Thank you for connecting with me today and know that my prayers for this book to help you find joy and peace in the midst of all that you're going through. Touching the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts. 